coinage in Greco-Roman times was not fiduciary. You know, nowadays, coins don't really have a, an intrinsic value. Well, they do, but it's not much. They're really just a sign that you owe someone a certain amount of money or that you bear a certain amount of value. In the ancient world, it was the silver or the gold that counted. So the reason they put a legend on this or a symbol on it was just to say, we're the Athenian state. You can trust us that this money has a particular amount of fineness. Hello, I am Cody Allingham, and this is the Transformation of Value podcast. In this episode, I speak with Dr. James Kerasteed, a research fellow with the New Zealand Initiative, focusing on higher education policy, including academic freedom. James co-hosts Free Kiwis, a podcast dedicated to free speech in New Zealand, and also has a background in classical studies, in particular democracy in ancient Greece. We talk about the declining state of New Zealand universities and the impact this has on graduates bringing their ideologies into the public sector. We also dive into the importance of language learning, the economies of ancient Greek city-states, and what we can learn from the past. If you would like to support this show and my work, please consider tipping some sats to the show's wallet. Otherwise, pass this episode on to a friend who you think may enjoy it. Every bit of support helps, and I do appreciate it. If you have any questions or feedback, please reach out. My emails are always open. Hello at the transformation of value.com. Otherwise, on to the show. But um, James, I'm, I'm keen to dive into a few different things. Um, your background, kind of what you're working on today, and then maybe going from there, looking at money and, and the way things used to work in the classical world. I mean, there's a few different um, threads here, but I thought... Maybe we could just start with a little bit about your background, your your studies, and, and where you're working at the moment, please. Okay, sure. I'll try and do this relatively quickly because it's a little bit complicated, basically because I was an army brat. My father was in the Canadian Army, so I moved all around the world, including lots of places within Canada and also a Canadian Army base in Germany and then England. And while I was in England, I got into classics. So I, I studied classics at Oxford. Uh, I studied ancient history in London, and then I went to Stanford to do a PhD uh, where I studied both um, ancient Greek democracy and modern democracy in um, political science courses. So I ended up taking a master's in political science there as well. And uh, and then I moved to New Zealand because I got a job teaching classics, and I taught at Victoria University of Wellington for 10 years. And last year I was dismissed from that role, um, about a year after coming part-time to the New Zealand Initiative, uh, where I was working on the number of administrators in New Zealand universities, and now I'm here full time. So I'm working on basically universities, university policy, and also uh, free speech, academic freedom, and and free speech in general. Yeah, because you you also co-host the Free Kiwis podcast, looking at free speech in New Zealand. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, I mean that's sort of partly dedicated to free speech and free speech issues. So we do sort of talk about that directly with representatives from the Free Speech Union in New Zealand and other organizations like that. But it's also just a, a chance to sort of talk to lots of interesting people and talk about things which we're not supposed to talk about, you know, the trans issue and uh, post-colonialism and whether Maori are underrepresented in academia, all those questions. And the point in all those discussions isn't necessarily to come to any conclusions. It's just to sort of make sure we can keep discussing these things openly. Yeah, no, I have a lot of respect for the Free Speech Union. And I had um, one of their uh, team members on the show last year. Uh, talking about it because it really is an issue in New Zealand. We sort of uh, conflate politeness with um, you know censorship, and there's a sort of a, a bit of a fine line there. And certainly the universities are a battleground for this. And I'm curious, you say you you got dismissed from the university. Was that in any way related to the work you were doing with the New Zealand Initiative, as far as you know? Um, I'm currently involved in a legal process against the university, so I okay. won't say any more. I understand. But, um, um, it's not my belief that that my um, that my sacking was fair and I'm pursuing that illegally. I understand. Um, thank you. And I guess looking at the classics side as well, so you talk about um, classics from Oxford and MA in ancient history. I mean, just broadly, would you say this is something that is well represented in New Zealand? Is this something that perhaps we're wanting for in terms of understanding history and uh, for such a young country as well, understanding our, our place in history? Well, it didn't used to be lacking. In fact, New Zealand has a great tradition of classics. It really used to punch above its weight. Uh, So, for example, Ronald Syme, Sir Ronald Syme, who was a professor of ancient history at Oxford and the author of possibly the most influential book on ancient Rome in the English language in the 20th century, which was the Roman Revolution. He actually comes from New Zealand originally. He's from the Taranaki region. Uh, 
And there are lots of other pretty distinguished classicists that came from New Zealand and usually went to Oxford or Cambridge and did classics that way. Some of them went uh, to Harvard or Yale as well. Um, yeah. But it's really on the decline now. And uh, Latin at schools used to have more of a presence in New Zealand. Uh, while I was here, though, that's kind of vanished. So they cut the Latin scholarship a few years into my time here. And now they I think it's basically true that Latin isn't taught at schools anymore. In New Zealand at this point, Greek never was, at least in, in living memory, whereas, of course, Greek and Latin are both taught at, um, at selective secondary schools in countries like La um, Italy and G Germany and Holland and I think France as well. Um, at the university level, also, things are looking very dire for classics in New Zealand. So at Victoria University of Wellington, part of the cuts that actually ended up uh, doing away with my job was also uh, cuts to languages. So they got rid of Greek and Latin teaching at Victoria. Uh, the vice chancellors of Victoria and Otago later stitched up a deal that um, you can still take Latin and Greek for credit at Victoria, but you'll be taught by um, lecturers at Otago. But anyway, you know, there used to be a, a thriving, um, there used to be a lot of teaching of Latin and Greek at Victoria University of Wellington, and we thought we did it pretty well, and that's no longer a thing. And, and the writing's on the wall, I think, for Latin and Greek, even at university level in New Zealand. That's interesting. I mean, along those lines, I mean, I studied Japanese, as you know, and we had the humanities department there, the language learning center. And when I went back to do a Chinese paper a couple of years back, I was really quite shocked that entire you know, facility had been gutted and turned into a kind of a communal space uh, for co-learning as opposed to an actual language learning center. And um, it was uh, yeah, problematic because I, uh, you know, there was quite a quite a good library there, um, you know, dictionaries, all that stuff that you need, and um, it just felt like it was quite short sighted. You know, New Zealand's role uh, in Asia Pacific, in particular, trying to learn Chinese is, uh, you know, it's pretty valuable, and there was no resources for it. So a little bit different to Latin and Greek, which I think uh, has its its roots and uh, maybe a, a longer term history, but certainly felt problematic you know this this way the universities had just been cutting these things and potentially at you know in, in favor of other topics uh, which you know have become more in vogue recently so I don't know how, how do you feel generally about the direction that you, New Zealand universities are heading in well it's a big question I mean just on the on the point about languages I mean I think that universities really across the English speaking world and maybe across the developed world as a whole. I mean, they used to be seen more as cultural institutions that they, they did the hard sciences. And um, actually, initially, they didn't really do that much business and commerce. But now, obviously, that's a huge part of it. I'm not against that. But there's been a long decline of the humanities. And I think that's going to continue. And I do actually think that that's, um, you know, not really the way of doing things. If you're in the edge of the world, like New Zealand, then you're very far from everywhere else. You really want to do everything you can to engage with the world and to equip yourself to engage with the world, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that obviously English speakers have a big advantage because a lot of people use their language, but um, it's it just teaches you much more about about cultures. It allows you to learn so much more about cultures, different cultures, and to engage with the rest of the world if you know a little bit about their languages and literatures. So I think that yeah, the continuing cuts to languages have been uh, misguided. Yeah, well, and also along those lines, I mean, I sort of had to pick it up on my own. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, don't speak Latin or I can't read it that well at, at all, but um, I'm, I'm a big fan of Gilbert Heath's The Classical Tradition, which is more of, I guess, an overview of, you know, the history uh, and how it has in, impacted uh, modern languages and the modern world. And you look at early English and sort of where it got its, uh, its connections to um, bigger ideas, even something as simple as abstract uh, nouns, uh, you know, it all came from Greek and, and Latin, and that's not something that you see uh, taught. And so you almost have this contemporary bias where you think that the world we live in today is this most civilized state that it could ever be in, and we're at this pinnacle of uh, civilization and, and development. But when you do go back and look at the history, you see uh, concepts around politics, um, some of the societal issues that we're facing today. I mean, these are eternal issues that have been. Uh, lamented and considered by people for a very long time, and in particular in the classic period. And so, do you think, though, it, it leads to a certain myopia in terms of political awareness or sort of? Civics? Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, you're making a kind of universal point there, which I think is a perfectly good one. That you know, the Greeks and the Romans 
we'll see the Greeks have to say, um, thought hard about these things and they had really sophisticated texts and a sophisticated understanding of these things. I mean, in a lot of cases, they actually developed the concepts that we use today, democracy, politics, philosophy, all those things, of course, are, are Greek words. So that's very important. I mean, I, I also would say something that sort of strays a bit into controversial territory, but I think that um, one of the problems with the huge bias that affects academia nowadays with sort of everybody on the left politically and all, all sort of tending to think in the same way about things is that it's become very difficult to talk about the West and the legacy of the West. And I understand that like some people on the right or the far right go too far with that. And like, you know, the West is the only thing worth thinking about. That's not the case, but it's still an important part of global cultural history. And if you come from a country like New Zealand or Australia, it is actually worthwhile to understand that history because a lot of the way that the country works, um, that actually comes from the Western inheritance in particular. But that's not to say that we shouldn't study uh, Pacific inheritance. New Zealand is also a very important Pacific country. It has lots of Polynesians that live in it, uh, especially its cities. Obviously, the Maori people are originally Polynesian. But um, I think, as I say, that um, there's a lot of political capital put into defending the study of Maori and uh, Pacific studies in the universities, but there's virtually no one nowadays who's willing to stand up and say, no, I think Greek and Latin are important because they're part of our Western heritage too, and, and that's also an important thing. I mean, the recent cuts at Victoria University of Wellington are a case in point. They ring-fenced Samoan in the cuts to the languages, and I actually think Pacific languages are really interesting. I've been to Samoa. I think it's a great place. I played rugby in Samoa, actually. There's a whole, whole other story, but um, you know, I also think that Huge languages like Italian or German are also important, and those aren't going to be taught at uh, Victoria University of Wellington anymore. And they have a huge literature and, uh, you know, texts uh, about philosophy and music and so on and so forth that Samoan doesn't have uh, to quite the same degree. Interesting. Yeah, I think what you said earlier as well sort of resonates with me. The, uh, you know, New Zealand as an island, uh, you know, we don't have the benefit of a natural flow of people from other parts of the world to the degree you would get in a continental uh, environment and so we kind of need to set out to actively explore the world and uh, obviously our own backyard and the Pacific region is important but you know what is happening in, the, in other parts of the world and, and what, what is the, the language and the historical culture I mean you, you get every now and then people go on their OE and they travel overseas but it is certainly a small number of people who sort of make it out of the gravitational pull that is New Zealand uh, to, uh, to to the rest of the world and perhaps arguably there's some uh, issues there where you don't quite see the New Zealand engagement with the world like you did in the old day and that sort of um, global outlook maybe it's a bit more insular um, and that has economic impacts you know if you can't do business you can't understand the thinking of the rest of the world which is really connected with language uh, it's really hard to go and do business and to, to make innovation happen. So it seems like there's quite a few connections there, but surprising that you mentioned Italian and German are getting cut as well, because that seems like a pretty, pretty bread and butter for languages. But um, Yeah, and Russian's no longer taught either. But yeah, now what you say is a huge concern of academics in New Zealand. We just had a, the, the initiative organized a big symposium on the future of universities, and a lot of the academics at that who were kind of speaking out about what bothered them. They were talking a lot about the attempt to implement Mataranga Maori or Maori traditional lore as part of the educational curriculum. And as a lot of them were saying, you know, it's not that Mataranga Maori or Maori traditional lore in itself is kind of worthless or uninteresting. It's hugely interesting. You know, every culture's um, history and, and lore is interesting, but there's a difference between that and science. And there's some places in the school curriculum where they've tried to insert, for example, the concept of Māori or life force and, and teach kids that uh, all particles have life force. And I think a lot of the scientists see that as a kind of mysticism that's creeping into the science curriculum. But the, the reason it's relevant to what you said is just because I, I think that another thing that bothered a lot of these scientists was just the idea that even though it may be worthwhile to look for, you know, some empirical knowledge in Māori traditional lore, such as knowledge of local uh, flora and fauna, the further you go in that direction, the more parochial New Zealand education becomes, right? So what you really want to be doing is, yes, giving kids some sense of their local traditions, but also connecting them with the world. And science nowadays is a very international endeavor. Scholarship in general is a very international endeavor. And so I think, yeah, the New Zealand educational establishment does us a disservice to the extent that it's 
sort of drives us towards thinking of ourselves just as this little island in the Pacific. We're also connected to the rest of the world and we can do universal science just like anybody else. Yeah, and we've certainly got a reputation for that historically. I don't need to look much further than uh, Rutherford and others who uh, have that same 20th century pedigree of uh, New Zealanders who kind of went away, did some amazing science, some amazing discoveries, um, and that may maybe there's a hist historical connection where a lot of these people had to go to the UK to p perform this work, um, but still they, you know, their the genesis was in New Zealand. And um, yeah, bringing back some of that could be quite quite powerful as New Zealand hint, <laughs> enters into these difficult economic times. But uh, looking moving on from that, so we've talked about your your work at the university, some of the challenges at the university, and now your your work with the New Zealand Initiative. But I, I'm keen to kind of connect these things as well because uh, the New Zealand Initiative really it's, it's putting itself out there as, um, and from my perspective, having conversations that the rest of New Zealand isn't really having. Um, we have a, a, a very sort of a shallow pool of discourse, in my opinion, uh, certainly in the mainstream media, but even with think tanks and government policy, you know, there's just a few people <laughs> in Wellington generally who, who are having these conversations, as you know. And when it comes to monetary policy, sort of the economic direction of New Zealand, um, I'm, I'm keen to talk a little bit about that. I mean, how do you see the New Zealand situation right now in terms of uh, the economic environment? Well, I'm not myself an economist. I mean, I really am a classicist by training and I work on uh, higher education policy. But um, obviously it's not great. I mean, one thing which has been going around the office recently is the dire state of New Zealand productivity. So we lag virtually all other developed countries in our GDP per hour. Um, and you know we're, we're just ahead of countries like Greece who obviously have sort of notoriously dire productivity. So that could be a lot better. I mean, I think that the belief uh, in the initiative is also that something more could have been done about inflation, that inflation was higher than it needed to be in New Zealand, uh, you know, for longer than it needed to be. So none of these things are great. Um, and of course, we have a new government, newish government still. And so hopefully there'll be some reforms on various fronts. I mean, infrastructure is also a big concern. I think you already talked to my colleague, Matthew Birchall, about this. Just the idea that we really need to sort of get things moving again and, you know, have some of that kind of... Um, ability just to kind of go and build stuff and make things happen that we used to, uh, you know, when in the 19th century, maybe the early 20th century. Um, and so I think all those things are being worked on. But, you know, as we've said already, New Zealand's the small island at the edge of the world. We really need our settings to be as open as possible. We need, you know, corporation taxes to be relatively low so that we actually get people to come here because otherwise they don't really have any reason to do that, right? And if Australia is working better, everyone's just going to go to Australia. And that's a classic thing in New Zealand history, right? That people will migrate to Australia when times are tough because the wages are much higher. And you know, there's a brief period, I think, in, under the key of prime ministership when I first got here that people, I think it was a net migration to New Zealand for like a year or two. But that certainly hasn't been the case for a long time. So yeah, things could improve uh, vastly. Do you think there's a connection here between... Um, I guess looking at the homegrown MPs and kind of the background to policy related to, say, the universities, is there a, a connection between understanding of economics, um, public policy, these kinds of things, and how that ends up actualizing itself in government policy and, and kind of economic settings? Is, do you think there's a connection between those two? It's hard to say. You know, I mean, I think I've talked to policy people here um, and through the initiative networks who say that they're not particularly impressed with the quality of economics graduates from New Zealand universities, and in some cases, even um, economics PhD holders from New Zealand universities. But um, yeah, it's hard to say how big an influence that has. I mean, my own experience is a little bit counter to that, to the extent that, well, I, I never dealt with economics majors or economics PhD students, but I would say that uh, with the students that I taught at, at Victoria University of Wellington, the... Um, the general level was low. I mean, the, the average level was kind of not great, or average, as they'd say in New Zealand, meaning not very good. Um, and, and the bottom third was kind of really bad, like to the extent that they wouldn't, those people wouldn't be at a university in, in the UK, probably not even in Canada. Um, but then I, I also think that the top students in New Zealand can be quite good. And the very top students often go into public service. I, I, I suspect that a lot of those top students went to a small number of particularly good schools either, you know, state schools in a really good, really high decile state schools in good catchment areas or private schools. And so the universities don't have much 
credit, you know, they can't take much credit for producing students of, uh, of the top level in, in, in this country. But yeah, so I, I don't, I don't know how much of an impact that has on the, on the government level, but, um, and of course we also get lots of immigrants and who, who work for the public service. So, so it's hard to say. Yeah, well, I, I guess what I'm getting at is I wonder if there's a certain paradigm or sort of school of thought within Wellington in particular that tends to mould uh, the thinking, uh, the direction of policy. Um, I mean, at a high level, you could call it, you know, left or right, but I don't know if that really encapsulates it. It's more like, what is the role of government, you know, um, the nanny state, these kinds of ideas, which I think are, are sort of endemic now you know we just assume the government fixes everything and besides the New Zealand initiative and maybe a few other organizations you know you don't really see a counterpoint to that and certainly not in the media either and I wonder if you know it's just sort of the blind leading the blind here where when times get tough well of course we need more government and there's not really a anyone with a background that's counter to that yeah no I, I, now you're talking yeah I, I see what you mean now I mean I, I guess I was talking about you know how what extent does the, do the universities affect the quality of the kind of top graduates? But in terms, just in terms of the sort of a bit, their abilities, you know, and their capacities. But in terms of the political environment, I definitely think that it's very skewed. And I mean, I, I've just been looking at data from across the English speaking world, and study after study demonstrates that there's actually quite an extreme skew at English speaking universities among academic staff in particular. So they're all on the left. And I agree with you that the, the most recent version of the sort of dominant ideology universities, the so-called kind of woke progressivism, it's not really something that strikes me as naturally left-wing, at least like if we went back to the 90s or early 2000s, left-wing people, in my experience, were actually more keen on free speech and more keen on sort of civil liberties. And I think that particular left that's now dominant in universities and in public policy is not particularly liberal. But yeah, I think it grew out of the left nonetheless. And that is a huge problem because you basically have that same ideology in the universities and in the public service and in a lot of the important institutions, which are actually supposed to provide some pluralism and some checks and balances on the main institutions, right? Like the human rights commissions, or various sorts of courts, right? And if these people are all being drawn from the same social class and they're all sort of having dinner parties with one another, it's very, very difficult to have a view which runs directly counter to that. So that's why I would, I would say that institutions like the initiative, organizations like this, are actually really important because they come from a different direction and hopefully we're, we're thoughtful and we go about it in a professional way and we don't just kind of scream and shout and point and yell woke but it's really important to have some kind of uh countercurrent intellectually even if you don't agree with us right just produces better conversations yeah well no certainly i saw a, a an online lecture from the victoria university of wellington public a school of public policy i believe it is down in papatia and it was really quite shocking it was like i was watching some uh well, I won't say what it was like, but it was very much, um, uh, you know, government fixes all problems, big government, these kind of uh, regressive ideas that maybe have connections to that post-war period uh, and that sort of thing. But this was in regards to COVID and the COVID strategy and just how government needs to fix everything. And it, it really goes against a lot of the free market thinking and just, you know, let businesses build the solutions, let the market build the solutions. You know, yeah. th these kind of things that we... We, we think, you know, we think of when we think of free markets. Yeah, I think that New Zealand is a complicated country. I mean, for, for a long time in the early 20th century, it had this view, it had this image as a sort of social workshop or laboratory where you could try out different things. So I think it definitely does have a strong strain of what we would call liberalism. I mean, centrist kind of classical liberalism, an emphasis on freedom. Uh, but it also has other strains, and, and that's legitimate. But um, one thing I think about the state in New Zealand is just that it's kind of like what George Orwell says about goose stepping. The English find goose stepping funny because they've never had to they've never had to be afraid of their own armies, right? They've never had to be afraid of their own soldiers. So with New Zealand, I think the, the one important thing is that they've never really had an absolutely tyrannical state. And that gives them a very benign view of the state. And sometimes the state is fine. I'm not saying it's it's I mean the fact is it hasn't been that tyrannical in New Zealand, but I think that people also need to be critical. You know, you also need to be open minded and think for yourself. And also, you know, people who go work for the public service, yes, they do that partly because they're public spirited and they want to make a difference, but they're also ordinary people, right? So if you look at the activity of public servants in the aggregate, they're a bureaucracy just like other bureaucracies. And we can expect that they'll, you know, in the aggregate, they'll want to have their salaries go up rather than go down. They'll want to have more security rather than less security. 
And all those things are, are natural, but they can, as I say, in the aggregate, they can produce uh, suboptimal outcomes for, for the country and also outcomes which aren't worth all the money that we're, we're currently paying them. Yeah, I, I agree. There's a certain naivete to the New Zealand government and the state. Uh, sort of, yeah, we, we've never had to go through um, a difficult trying times to the degree that many uh, European countries, for example, have. And, you know, again, study of history can reveal this. You could look back and say, okay, well, that that moment where the public consciousness was captured by a charismatic leader um, and we were all uh, corralled into a certain mode of being and arguably the last few years, uh, especially the COVID response, was an example of that naivete being taken advantage of. Uh, and, you know, there was really, uh, you know, everyone, uh, almost everyone went along with uh, a plan of attack, which ultimately has led to this current state of inflation, uh, massive social divide and just a general malaise in the country. And very few people pushed back. Uh, so, yeah, problematic. Yeah. Uh, However, um, sorry, so just I, I wanted to move on, though, to talking about markets, because this was something we, we chatted about um, in a previous um, engagement where you, you mentioned markets as liberty. And I thought that was quite a striking uh, idea, um, especially as we enter some of these more uh, this bi bipolar, perhaps multipolar world where you've got maybe a, an emphasis on protectionism. You've got sort of more barriers to trade coming up. Tell me a little bit, James, about markets as liberty. Well, I mean, it's not, that's not an idea I came up with. I mean, that's something you can find in the in the writings of any kind of classical liberal or, or libertarian economists. And I mean, the basic idea is very intuitive, right? That you you can choose what you want to buy, and the a market has a kind of amoral quality to it. So, you know, I give you money and you give me services, whether those are hamburgers or you know, teaching me Latin or Greek or you're giving me a shirt or some kind of high fashion. You know, it doesn't really matter what we think of one another, what I think of your religion, what you think of my ethnicity. We're just going to make the trade. We, you know, if, if we're both willing to, we're going to make the trade for these economic reasons. And I think, you know, people often see that as a kind of tawdry thing. But in fact, it, it can be seen as sort of quite a nice uh, aspect of the market, that it's a form of cooperation, right? It brings people together in this, in this manner. And actually, there's some literature recently, there have been some really interesting studies of hunter-gatherers. There was one that they did in Greenland, where they just expose them to markets. I mean, literal markets, you know, they because they see the um, hunter-gatherer, traditional hunter-gathering people that are closest to, to towns with markets, and they do various types of games and um, surveys of them, and they find that they're actually more pro-social. So they actually have you know, the, more pro-sociality towards non-kin. So in other words, they're more open and they're nicer and they're fairer uh, around people who are not, uh, they're not related to genetically. So even though the market is sort of amoral in the sense that it doesn't depend on what we think of one another's beliefs, it can actually have this um, product, this outcome that we all actually sort of get along in this particular way. And it does so in a way that, you know, preserves freedom because we're still just sort of making choices. We're not compelled to do this by any external force. So that's the, that's the market as freedom. But I, I, one of the things that interests me greatly is that, you know, this is uh, sort of things tag with free market sympathies. And, um, I didn't always do this. And when I was in ancient history, I had a huge interest in direct democracy. So the direct democracy of the Athenians and the ancient Greeks. And I did a course a few years ago on, it was actually called ancient democracy and modern liberalism. But one of the big questions in that was really a perennial question of do democracy and liberalism go together? I see some libertarians are quite skeptical of democracy in some ways, but I actually think they go together. So one way to look at the market is as an aggregator of information or as a compressor of information. So uh, what Friedrich Hayek says about price is a beautiful example of how markets can take information about supply and demand, you know, how many shoes there are out there and how many people want them. And it'll beautifully compress all the information down into one figure. These shoes cost $100. And I think that libertarians and classical liberals are often attracted to that because it's not top down. It's not an elitist way of looking at the world. It actually aggregates everyone's preferences and it treats them as equal. And for me, this is also something that democracy does. A democracy does it in a slightly different way. It does it using the vote. But the idea is, is still that you aggregate the preferences of people and you make better decisions based on all of these inputs that are coming in from across the country from different types of people. And again, it has this sort of amoral element where you don't sort of start off by saying, well, who are the good people? You know, who are the upper class people or who are the educated people? No, no, no. You just say, what does everybody think? And, and you aggregate the information that way. And I think that's actually interestingly similar to what markets do.
Interesting. I'm just wanting to pull on that thread a little bit more and uh, talk about the relationship maybe with the classical period and markets. And I, I don't understand that there would have been a history prior to that, but I'm reminded of the opening line of Plato's Republic, where he says, I went down to the Piraeus, uh, which as I understand is a sort of uh, shipping uh, trade area in Athens, is it? Um, That's right, yep. It was sort or of yeah, the port area where you'd have this trade. And I've read many interpretations of what that particular phrase means, but um, the, the the idea that it started off in, in a market in a cosmopolitan area amongst many other uh, people, it seems very, very interesting. So how do you see the connection between markets and ideas of markets and say the classics? Well, that's interesting. I, I did study um, ancient economic history for a tiny bit. I mean, it wasn't like one of my major areas of expertise, but basically in a nutshell, the past sort of century of research into the ancient Greek and Roman economy has been like this. So there was this towering figure called Moses Finley, and he was actually originally an American. He was a socialist, and he was persecuted by McCarthyites. So there's an interesting connection to some of the academic freedom issues I've been looking into. Anyway, he eventually went to Cambridge and became this very productive and great ancient historian. And his view was basically that he was, he was inspired and influenced by anthropology, which was at that point making serious inroads in, into classics. And he saw the Greeks and Romans as a kind of primitive society uh, where they didn't really have developed markets. They didn't have economics as an autonomous realm of human interaction. Really, when Greeks and Romans traded things, it was really a kind of gift giving. And it was all about status. And, you know, if you look in the Iliad, you can see versions of this where people will trade suits of armor with one another. And for Finley, you know, everything in antiquity, even into the Roman Empire, was a bit like that. And... Uh, I did my PhD at Stanford in classics, and one of the exciting things about that was that a lot of the scholars who kind of overturned that orthodoxy were there. So there's a volume called The Cambridge History of the uh, Greek Greco Roman Economy, I think. And it's actually the Stanford history because it's edited all three of them with Stanford scholars, uh, Scheidel and Ian, Walter Scheidel and Ian Morris and uh, Richard Sather. And they overturned Finley's view basically just by looking at the evidence. and. If you read a lot of these texts, so like Xenophon's Poroi, work by Xenophon called the, the Ways of Means or the Resources, however you want to translate that, that word, he actually is thinking about markets. He's thinking about how the state can also play a role in, in Athens markets and how Athens can make itself really attractive as a market. So there's an agora market in the central center of Athens. And we know from this text and also from other evidence that the Athenians had things like a market overseers. And one of the jobs of the market overseers was to make sure that when other people were trading in the agra, they could have very swift resolution of disputes. And they also had these specialized maritime courts. So when people came in ships uh, and they were trading in the Praeus, they could also, you know, resolve their disputes very quickly. There's a really fascinating inscription we have, which talks about uh, setting up a particular type of market overseer who will actually check the, the purity of your coin. So if you have a coin, someone gives you an Athenian owl coin, and you're not sure about the fineness of the silver, you can actually refer that to an impartial overseer. And it seems that the Athenians were thinking like this. They were thinking, we need, this, we need to set up this institution so that the overseer uh, has a reputation for fairness. Because if we don't, people aren't going to come to our market. To the extent that people think that they're being treated well in the Athenian market, uh, to that extent, we're going to make more money, and, and Athens is going to become more and more of a hub. So anyway, that's just some of the evidence. Uh, there's a guy called Alain Bresson at Chicago who's also done great work, uh, not only in Athens, but with other Greek city-states, showing that, yes, they thought about markets. They, they, the society was highly monetized. In some ways, it was quite sophisticated. You have simple kinds of banks, which are run out of temples. Um, so nowadays, th this revolution, I think, is getting going. And we now see the ancient Greek and Roman economy as definitely not as sophisticated as modern or early modern European economies, but it's sort of on the road there. And Ian Morris has argued that if you look at the level of consumption and the level of population in Greece between about 800 BC and 300 to 200 BC, you actually have a, you know, a small but a significant and consistent level of economic growth all through that period. And that continues into the Roman Empire. So by the time you get to the second century AD, uh, the time that Gibbon in the 18th century referred to as the sort of happiest time that mankind had ever lived up to that point, you do have, by, by early modern standards, a very prosperous, uh, very secure area with you know, quite well-functioning markets. 
Mm. Interesting. And I'm, I'm curious, uh, two, two things. One, uh, the, or the, sim the simpler one to talk about maybe is the role of taxation and state in, in the monetary side of things. Uh, but then also talking about, well, actually, we'll start there. So yeah, the, the state, um, seniorage, the creation of currency, these kinds of things. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there would have been periods of change in different ki kinds of money. But at a high level, how would you describe the format or the configuration of money in this period? Okay, so um, this is another big topic. Um, so in the West, the oldest coins were the ones that were found under the foundations or in the foundations of the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus. Ar Ephesus is a Greek city on the coast of Asia Minor, what's now Turkey. They had a huge cult to Artemis and um, a big temple there. And that temple was built in the 7th or 6th centuries BC. And the foundation level, the deposit is dated to something like 650 to 625 BC. And they found a jar there with 19 electrum coins on them. And they're, they're marked with in squares. So basically, they're literally lumps of electrum. And someone's just punched a mark on them. It doesn't have a design or a symbol, just a mark. And you can find those in the British Museum, actually. They, they have an interesting display with the jug sort of pouring out these electrum coins. Those are the earliest coins that we know of in the West. Hmm. Um, and then the Greeks quickly started adopting this coinage in Egana and Athens and other Greek city-states. And the Athenian coins that they started minting maybe just before or around the time that Cleisthenes installed the Athenian democracy, the silver coins with an owl on them, the Athenian owls, they became uh, what one historian has called the Athenian greenback. So they became widely used, kind of like the American dollar across the Aegean, to such an extent that in some places like Egypt uh, and the Levant, you find so-called imitation owls where people have tried to kind of create an Athenian stamp uh, on, a, on a lump of metal. We can actually tell now that that wasn't created by the Athenian state. But the reason that they did this was because the reason they put a stamp on it, all these different city-states, was because coinage in Greco-Roman times was not fiduciary. You know, nowadays coins don't really have a, an intrinsic value. Well, they do, but it's not much. They're really just a sign that you owe someone a certain amount of money or, the, or that you bear a certain amount of value. In the ancient world, it was the silver or the gold that counted. So the reason they put a legend on this or a symbol on it was just to say, we're the Athenian state. You can trust us that this money has a particular amount of fineness. And as I say, they did set up institutions to try and reassure people that if you use Athenian coins, then you know you would get you would be using the correct amount of silver, the amount of silver they claimed. Now, uh, the problem is that once you get into the Roman Empire and they start having you know coinage that's used across the empire, there's always this risk, there's always this temptation of seniorage, there's this temptation to kind of carve off a little bit of the value of your coin to debase the the purity and to tell people that. You know, this is the amount of money, this is the amount of uh, coin silver that there is, but actually, you know, you're taking a little bit away from that fineness every year and making money out of it. And you can find graphs online of the purity of Roman coins, um, you know, the silver denarius, especially, also gold coins like the Arius. And actually, the first few, the Republic, it seems to be okay. We haven't got that much information. Uh, but then the first uh, Judeo Colic. Claudian dynasty of emperors, they also do okay. The money seems to hold up. And then as you get further into the crisis of the third century and uh, Antoninus Pius and that kind of era, you just have, it sort of falls off a cliff. And it, can, it continues to decline quite quickly. Interesting. Um, and then you start having these things like the price edict where they're trying to fix prices. And of course, that never really works. So yeah, it's a big problem all the way through the, the Roman Empire. Yeah, and, and I'm curious, in terms of the tax, um, I'm assuming uh, these different kinds of coins, uh, the, the seals, you know, denominated that it was an official uh, assayed, uh, verified uh, uh, amount of uh, whatever rare material, um, rare element, that they, these were demanded for tax payment, is, is that right? So you had a, a, a requirement to pay your taxes with this local currency? Um. I'm not so sure about Rome. I mean, I assume that's the case. Um, in, and there's also kind of um, property requirements for certain levels, social levels, like to be an eques or a knight or a senator. Um, in Athens, so I know, I know most about Athens, and the Athenian case is interesting because they have taxation, but elite taxation is not in monetary form. Okay. So if you're one of the top 1% richest Athenians, you have to pay what's known as a liturgy. And for a liturgy, you actually... Um, it's a kind of compulsory 
philanthropy. So you have to pay for something big. And the most usual forms this took was either you pay for a warship for a single season, you build and run the warship for a single season, which is two or three months in the summer, or you pay for a play, the Festival of Dionysus, which involves uh, getting costumes for a chorus and training the chorus and putting on the play. So um, that's kind of interesting. That's a whole interesting world in and of itself. And But that wasn't in coin money. That was in terms of just paying for certain things. And if you thought that you didn't deserve that, that you weren't rich enough to pay the tax to be forced to pay this tax you could there was a um a mechanism called the antithesis where someone else could challenge you to swap properties right so if you you think oh if your property is so small why don't you why don't you swap it with mine and then you'll have more right and then it's interesting because it seems like the athenian state there is sort of outsourcing the trouble of gaining the information about who is the richest person right it sort of makes the rich guys uh reveal that information to the Athenian state. Interesting, because that leads on to the other thing I wanted to ask you about, which is uh, fundamentally, I think it's difficult to unpick the post-Christian uh, or you know Christian worldview and the modern worldview from the classical worldview. I mean, you really have to study it deeply, and even then it's hard to really put yourself back into that context of what it would have been like. And I'm curious about the role of something like sacrifice uh, and these other kind of abstractions that live on top of maybe what we would call value or, or some other idea, I don't, I don't quite know, where, um, you know, we see it today, again, through the Christian Western lens of, of you know, paganism and, and these historical processes. But for those people, I, I think it certainly maybe could have been seen as an economic incentive to sacrifice uh, to ensure better outcomes, you know, kind of almost like an insurance or something like that. So do, do you have any just general ideas on what uh, sacrifice in particular meant and how it, we could relate it to economics? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, um, so in the Greek world, it's interesting because in our earliest text, so again, Homer, you get this phenomenon where the warriors all sacrifice together and they eat meat and they share it out and the and the meat goes to the top warriors. And then once you get into classical Athens, which is a very kind of self-consciously democratic state, you start having these big public sacrifices. Well, you have public sacrifices before, but I mean, they're very sort of um, institutionalized and you have a hecatomb, you know, like a hundred oxen, sacrifice them and you have all this meat and you share it out among the people. And we have evidence also of public banqueting in Athens with these special rooms where individual officers of the state who are often sort of chosen by lot or elected, they'll also share out food in this sort of ritual manner, in this very self-consciously egalitarian manner. So these sacrifices can be quite big business. And by the time you're in these you know, well-developed city-states, it's really part of the state expenditure. And there's uh, an Australian scholar called David Pritchard who did a book a few years ago about Athenian public expenditure. And he finds that by far the, the highest, the, the, the biggest expenditure of the Athenian state in the classical period was war. That's the main thing they're paying money for. But then two others are important too. One of them is the amount of money they spend on the democratic system itself. And the other is public festivals. And the Athenians were famous for having loads and loads of public holidays. And on these public festivals, they would have had sacrifices and they would have had choruses singing to the gods. So it's kind of hard to know what to make of these as a historian, because whatever you think about religion, I mean, no one literally, very few people, I should say, with respect to neo-pagans, still believe that, you know, Athena was a real goddess or that Artemis was a real thing. Um, so in, in one sense, these people are just wasting their money, right? Why are they spending all this time worshipping the gods? But I think if you try and see it as, out of a more kind of Durkheimian sociological lens, uh, these religious rituals and sacrifice and things like that, even though they're kind of a drain on the state, they may also have benefits in terms of social cohesion. And so pooling money to sacrifice in that sense, uh, you know, makes a little bit more sense. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm reminded as well of sort of Eastern, um, uh, Asia, East Asian uh, spiritual practices, religious practices, and sort of the role of money. And I've talked about this quite a lot on the show in terms of you have spirit money that you burn for your you know, uh, family members in the afterlife or the role of money in, in temples. Even just this morning, I went for this walk to Hachimangu and you know, you've got the boxes where you can drop in a five yen coin and, and these kinds of things. And that monetary role of uh, religious organizations and, and temples and things, which you mentioned before, a lot, a lot of the proto banks 
uh, in, in Greece were based out of the temples. And there's a, the, uh, the classic story of, of Jesus chasing out the, the, the money changers from the temple and, and that. And so we've got this uh, kind of uh, modern view of uh, economics, banking, finance as very secular, as, as sort of uh, its own thing. But there is this kind of historical relationship to religion. And I wonder if in maybe a Nietzschean kind of way, there's a connection between um, the way we revere money or we kind of, you know, we, we give fiat money some sort of you know value uh, because it's said so by the state and the state has gone on to replace uh, religion in, in, many, in many Western countries. And so, I don't know, broadly, any connections there that you see? Yeah, for me, I think the, the one of the reasons that they put so much money into this stuff is just that you can imagine, I mean, imagine what would happen if, you know, you were an Athenian and imagine you were Pericles and you just said one day, look, I want to spend all this money on making a huge statue of myself in a, in a very nice building. And we're going to call it the, you know, the Pericleon and everyone's going to sacrifice to it. And, you know, it would just seem incredibly arrogant. Now, in some societies, of course, the elites are linked to the gods, but in these more democratic or Republican societies, you can't do that. And you also can't really sort of just say, look, this building is called the Athens is Awesome building, and it's going to have a massive statue of like Athens being awesome. But what you can do, you can't build a Pericleon, you can't build an Athens is Awesome building, but you can build a Parthenon, which you say, no, 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 it's sacred to the goddess Athena. So what we're really doing is, is worshipping the goddess Athena. And that immediately uh, puts what you're doing in a different light. You know, you're presenting yourself there, and maybe you genuinely do feel this way, as kind of humble and sincere and it's not like an ego-driven thing. It's like, no, 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 we're worshiping the goddess Athena. And, you know, of course, the implication is you guys should be doing this too. We're actually good kind of humble people. And if you think about the Parthenon, I mean, it was hugely expensive. It was part of this whole so-called Periclean building project on the Acropolis together with the Eric Theon and some other structures. Um, and there's, inside of the, the, there was this huge Chris Elephantine, in, otherwise, in other words, um, gold and ivory statue of Athena. And then in the cella, the back, room of the temple, you actually had loads of money, just loads of coin money and stuff. And th that was the basis for uh, Greek, uh, sort of these proto-banks. So if you read Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, he actually tells you about this in great detail, that the Chris Elephantine statue of Athena in the Parthenon, it had lots of gold on it. I mean, it was half gold, half ivory, uh, or like a little bit gold and a little bit ivory. But they could actually detach elements of it. So I think maybe the shield uh, and the breastplate or something of Athena, you could actually detach and you could melt it down. So at a certain point in the war against the Spartans and their allies, when the Athenians are really struggling and they need to build more ships fast, then they say, oh, okay, this money that's really Athena's, we're going to borrow from Athena. So you can see how that can start to create these proto-banks where you can borrow something. But the thought is, no, 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 we need to pay it back to Athena. And there's a really strong kind of sense of if you don't pay back money to Athena, that's extra bad. Like if it was just if it was just some guy lending you money, then maybe it'd be pretty pretty bad to not pay him back. But it's actually in a temple. It's from Athena. You're taking it from her house. She's lending it to you. And then you have to pay it back. But it also shows that they can be a little bit fast and loose with this, right? It's like, no, 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 we're giving this money to Athena. But at the back of their mind, it's like, yeah, but if we ever get in, in, into real trouble, we can actually melt down this, this uh, uh, statue or bits of the statue. And it's not sacrilegious. Interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, well, that, two, that reminds me of two things. I mean, I think firstly, when we talk about the United States, um, you, you look at some of this neoclassical architecture and sort of just the, the structure of the buildings, these kind of Federal Reserve kind of Washington type buildings, and they really have this uh, a certain kind of Greek uh, Roman look to them as, as a first point, but more closer to home. Uh, this kind of imbuement, this incumbent of you know, secular government institutions with a godlike character, uh, we don't have to look much further than the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, which uh, calls itself Te Putia Matua, and it uses imagery of Tane Mahuta, the, the forest god, the great kauri tree. It, it, it takes imagery of Maori mythology, which connects to what we were talking about earlier, and it sees itself in this kind of protectorate kaitiaki role, and I find that very interesting because that, it wasn't always necessarily like that, but the way that they've done that now really aligns with this, the story of Athena where if it was just Adrian Orr and his cronies, uh, you know, it would be a different story, but it's it's Tipitia Matua. It's the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. It has a certain uh, ambiance to it that makes it less um, or more, maybe perhaps more trusted 
at, at a psychological level. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I mean, so the story I told about the kind of inter uh, the connection between religion and proto banking in the ancient Greek world is it's interesting because I wonder whether in the early modern period there was still that connection. I mean, my sense is that once you get into the early modern period and the modern European period. There's actually more of secularization, you know, that they see these institutions as separate from from religious institutions. And then, you know, for most of the 20th century, I would say, well, I'm not going to say banks have a good record necessarily, but I'll <laughs> say that, you know, for long periods, you know, people were trusted to sort of basically pay back or the banks were trusted to kind of give people the money that was supposed to be in their accounts without any religious sanction. I mean, of course, there were obviously the Great Depression, whatever, when they were unable to actually meet their obligations. But um, but it, my point is just that for long periods they've done that without religious obligations. And but it's interesting because I think that yeah, this sort of uh, woke or whatever you want to call it ideology from universities. One of the interesting features of it is that it seems to a lot of onlookers to have these religious qualities. Yes. Um, and so I think that twenty or thirty years ago, if you'd said, you know, we're going to make the Reserve Bank explicitly Christian, everyone would have been horrified, and it, you know, I think probably rightly, and it would, wouldn't have gone anywhere. Even though like some institutions in New Zealand and Britain still have a little bit of a flavor of the established church uh, because of historical reasons, but I don't think anyone takes it seriously. But yeah, there's a lot of the Maori spirituality stuff around, and that goes back to what I was saying right at the beginning, right, with, um, with the Maturanga Maori in schools, that not all of it is spiritual, but there's these aspects like Māori and life force that, that creep in. And I think you know people have their sort of defenses down uh, because it's well, not Christianity, so they think of it as not religion, but it, it can yeah. also be religion. Well, pulling on that thread a little bit, I'm sure I'd, I'd have to go and find dig it out, but I'm, I'm sure the the, the Maori, uh, you know, the life force um, phrase you just mentioned, I believe that is actually used in what, some of the presentations from the Reserve Bank of New Zealand in terms of their conceptualization of how money flows through an economy, and again, that image of Tani Mahuta and the great Kauri tree in the forest, and sort of the the leaves and the, and, and and the way that you know money sort of goes goes through. The, the the organism and they they align that with the economy and it sort of a, is this unscientific sort of um, you know, vague spiritualism that sort of waves its hands and says well the economy is this spiritual being you know it's it's magical and and we're sort of the, the guardians of that which doesn't lend itself to the critical thought which I believe you know I'm very interested in you know in terms of monetary revolution where actually you know there is ways of looking at this and and we can we can understand that there are principles that apply to economics which are scientific you know and even though they are generally human action based um there's a logic there's incentives there's principles that apply yeah. and i don't know maybe there's just a connection there yeah yeah i'm not sure i mean one thing i'd say although again i'm not an economist but i i work with a lot of economists and i think that our view here at the initiative we don't have a corporate view but like a lot of people's view over the past few years has just been that uh, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, and I think probably there are other uh, central banks across the English speaking world that have done similar things. The, the, definitely the Reserve Bank of New Zealand has kind of taken on various remits that we don't really think are central to its mission. So really the central bank should, or the Reserve Bank should, fun should focus on price control, right? Keep inflation under 2%, whatever your target is. And, you know, I think, I think they had as one of their official remits at some point to keep climate change uh, under control or something, or that was in the <laughs> air. I think that's now been cut back by the new government. But it's it's not even that I think that, you know, keeping climate change under control is a crazy thing to want to do. I mean, obviously, I think climate change is real, and I think that we need to sort of deal with it in some ways. But it's just that, you know, different institutions are meant to have different jobs, and these things are quite complicated. Life comes at you fast in these complex institutions. So you really just want to focus. And actually, price control is probably hard enough, right, as the last few years have shown. So maybe just try and keep inflation down and leave the climate change and the spirituality and stuff to maybe spiritual organizations and climate change organizations. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think you can be encumbered with different, uh, well, you know, you're, you're in between a rock and a hard place. Um, and when you've got a, a number of remits and a number of tasks, because uh, there's also, um, I believe it's, reducing the unemployment rate as well was another yeah. sort of requirement and so they were sort of having one they had one lever in which to change things which had to affect all of these other things it's an impossible decision to make and it basically in a way sort of hamstrings them but it also leads to i think a lot of waste and and a lot of research and just kind of uh you know, special working groups that are doing stuff that doesn't maybe add any value 
Um, but I, I do think maybe sort of looking to wrap this up a little bit, but this understanding of the structure kind of the meta structure of these organizations i think certainly a, a study of history can be very informative um i don't i certainly don't think for a minute that we're at any pinnacle of of civilization right now and to, to assume that we are and that we're at the leading edge of innovation for any kind of um, political civic institution is is folly and and you you need to look back at these historical moments these collapses of currencies collapses of uh, economies to understand well how did this happen and how do we avoid it you know what what, what can we do to get out of this situation which i don't think is particularly uh looked at here in new zealand yeah no i definitely agree with that i mean um my original interests my one of my main research interests in classics was actually what we can learn from ancient greek democracy and that's also one of those areas where you think well you know we have pretty well functioning democracies representative democracies and i would agree with that but if you look at how the Greeks did things, it was actually radically different. And, you know, in some ways that wasn't a good thing. You know, they had slaves that women weren't allowed to vote. So we probably don't want to bring that back. I, just, I certainly don't. But um, there are other things, for example, that they used a lot of sortition, random allotment. And that's actually an issue that, that's um, been picked up quite recently by a lot of political scientists and philosophers. And now people with sort of more hands-on experience who are kind of running these citizens assemblies. So that's an example. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's necessarily going to work out and we should we should replace all elected offices with with um, allotted offices immediately or anything like that. I think we should be very cautious. But it's at least a kind of interesting idea that we can look at. Um, and it's something that doesn't really come to us from the modern tradition. The modern tradition of representative democracy is all about elections. And then you just look back at this completely different, almost alien time, and you look at how they were doing democracy, and you think, oh, actually, that's that's interesting. Maybe we could think about that more. So I think that you know, monetary history probably has uh, has a lot of similar cases. Yeah, and, and I think we talk about New Zealand as the social experiment for these kinds of forms of governance and, and social structures. And I think looking at where we're at today, I mean, how, how do you even have a discourse about new ways of governance? Because I think there's a certain, uh, what would you call it, uh, ossification of the idea of the state and sort of what its role is. And we, we sort of changed maybe some of the little pieces on the surface and, and the configuration, but actual broad sweeping reform, I mean, it's kind of not really an option. You know, how, how do you vote your way out of uh, a certain form of government? You know, you can vote for a party, but there's no real other mechanism. And uh, historically, it was thought leaders, and it was philosophy, it was people like Plato and Socrates and these guys walking around the Piraeus having conversations, uh, free speech, that led to ideas disseminating. And as you know, you know, some of those ideas actually ended up um, becoming very dangerous and um, you know, people were executed for talking about these things, um, you know, these, these philosophers. And so is this where we're running into issues with free speech, universities, education, where it's not enabling the innovation and in thought for new ways of being? Oh, that, that's definitely one of the problems, yeah. And I mean, it's not, not even just innovation. Well. It's innovation in the sense of these new things which are coming up. So, for example, the whole trans issue is not one that we had in the same way years ago. I mean, people say there were probably trans people back then, and there probably were to some extent. But, I mean, all these things about bodily modification, they didn't really come up. So that's an issue where it's like, okay, it's a new issue. My uh, preference would be to talk about it openly, right? And there's probably it's probably the case that trans people of various sorts have claims. I think they certainly do have claims and that women have certain claims and that other people who are skeptical of these movements have certain claims. The religious people have certain claims. And then for me, what we're meant to do in a liberal democracy is really come together and discuss these things and think about them intelligently in terms of policy and find some way through which is as satisfactory as possible to the largest number of people. All those groups that I just talked about, you should be able to find some solution. Maybe not everyone's going to be 100% happy, but that's what we should be able to do. And there are all sorts of issues like that, which I think people find it very, very difficult to talk about because they're getting canceled. Whether they get in big trouble, they'll lose their job or they'll, um, you know, their friends won't talk to them anymore or they'll have a breakup in their family. I mean, I've heard cases of that in the modern culture wars and that's not great at all, I don't think. And, you know, it's really going to hamstring our ability to function as a, as a free and democratic uh, society and, and solve some of these problems. Yeah. Well, sorry, one slightly bigger question. This might be a bit much, but I guess looking at, say, you know, the Republic and so sort of that uh, exploration of the good and and sort of the, <laughs> yeah, how do, how do you even describe it? You know, the, the highest forms of truth. 
in this modern world, this um, you know, in many ways secular world, is it a case that we struggle to communicate across these lines because there's no highest form of truth or kind of highest uh, ideal that we can all reference? It's sort of the, the, the demise of secularism, which means, you know, everyone has their own kind of form of God or own form of truth that they sort of struggle to kind of to communicate between each other. Like, I don't know, how do we even have a conversation when we're on just different wavelengths? Yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, I definitely think that if you look at a country like New Zealand, especially, I think that the range of opinions were probably was probably much, much smaller, even if you go back before the raw genomics reforms and the, the free market reforms of the 80s. Uh, from what I've heard, I mean, it wasn't there, but New Zealand was just a much more closed place, you know, economically, but also and these things often go together socially and ideologically, right? That basically all you could do was like, what was it, beer, rugby and racing were the three elements of New Zealand culture. And and now obviously there's a lot more out there and people have YouTube and they have podcasts like this one. You can find something on any partic- on any sort of ideological wavelength and run with it. I mean, for me, that's actually kind of nice. Like, I think that's sort of the beauty of liberalism that people can follow their own paths. Does it make it more difficult to talk to one another? Probably, but I, I sort of think that I'm not really a Platonist. I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure how far I go into the sort of transcendent um, universals thing. Although I think there are some of those, like truth is a is a some kind of universal has some kind of existence. But I do think I have more faith in something like human nature. Like I think fundamentally, in our kind of hardware, we're all pretty similar. And I think even ideologically, people often underestimate the extent to which they they all kind of want the same thing. I mean, I think that often it's in liberal democratic societies over the past 20 years or so, it's been like a, a freedom versus equality trade-off. And the the neoliberal right has been more into market freedom and uh, and the left, the left in the past was more into social freedom, but also into equality. Um, but but often these things are kind of the same. Like if everyone's free, they have an equal amount of freedom, right? So these the freedom and equality also flow into one another. And I think that I, I read about some study in the States a while back where they actually asked Republicans and Democrats to make a list of the things which are most important to them in life. I mean, in a values sense. And they were actually astonishingly similar in the end. So they, I think they had different orderings, but they were basically the same list of like security and respect and dignity and um, prosperity freedom, equality, you know, they all sort of hit both the, the list of the right-wing people and the left-wing people. So my hope is if we can just dial down some of the tribalism, you know, because the tribalism is all about these sort of superficial signifiers. I'm on the woke side, I'm on the non-woke side, or whatever. If we can kind of dial that down, then uh, hopefully actually insist on having these conversations rather than canceling them. Yeah. And hopefully we can start having good conversations again. Well, perhaps... Um another way of looking at this uh you know we live in a multicultural world of course there's different religions different people communicate but we come back to the piraeus and we wander down there and we talk about markets because at the end of the day who wants to be poor really you know and if we can maybe look at that as an ideal we can look at trade and um you know being able to trade with anyone despite what you may think of their political religious beliefs at the end of the day, a busy bazaar with you know traders from all over the world selling their goods, um, trading money, exchanging value. I mean, perhaps that's the ideal of the contemporary world that we can look at. And anything that gets in the way of that government intervention and monetary policy, government uh, sanctioning and censorship of transactions, etc. Maybe all of those things are actually what lead to a form of tribalism alongside fiat money. So maybe what we need is a global, interoperable, unsensible money, something like Bitcoin potentially. Um, but maybe that's that's where the future lies, is trade, engagement and exchange of value. Yeah, I mean, I think we need some institutions, but I definitely agree with you that part of the answer to this, and part of the answer already is that we're trading, well, for a long time, we were trading with each other more. Now there's a bit of a backlash, but I mean, you know, certainly through my life, the world has sort of traded more with the rest of the world and places like India and China have really opened up in a way that didn't look likely before that happened. And it's been a huge boon to the very poorest people in China and India. We've now got a much bigger global middle class. And I think it's kind of pleasant to go around the world nowadays and you can kind of be more on a wavelength of people and interact with them in, in these ways. Yeah, cool. Well, hey, James, I really appreciate your time um, and, and sharing your you know, profound knowledge on these uh, classical topics, which I must admit I'd love to study a, a bit further and, and, and get back into myself. But 
if people want to follow your your work um, and 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 what and what you're doing, where, where can they find you? Well, I think the best place now would be my YouTube channel, James Kirstead YouTube, and that's where we have all the episodes of Free Kiwis. You can also get that as a podcast on any podcast provider. But I got that, and I also have some content about the ancient Greek world. So. If you're keen, even on ancient Greek language, if you're keen on that kind of stuff, to geek out on that, then that's a good place to go. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot, Cody. Cool. Thank you for listening. I do hope you enjoyed the show. I am Cody Allingham, and that was the Transformation of Value. If you'd like to get in touch, please send me an email at hello at the transformation of value.com, and I will get back to you.